Hello and welcome to Audiobook Connection, behind the scenes with the creative teams. I'm Becky Parker Geist and I'm your host. Audiobook Connection is your place to learn about the audiobook creative process in discussions between the authors, narrators, producers, and post production teams that bring them all together, as well as guests who have listened to the audiobooks and have questions for the creative teams. This podcast is sponsored by Pro Audio Voices, helping great stories come alive through audiobook production and marketing. Today I have with me Joseph Durrett. He's the author of Fight or Flight, A South Side Story. This is Joe's debut novel and audiobook. Joe lives with his wife Wendy and rescue cat Cheddar in his lifelong hometown of South Windsor, Connecticut, suburb of Hartford. Joe's a graduate of the Cinema Arts undergraduate program at the University of Hartford and the Writing, Rhetoric, and Media Arts graduate program at Trinity College. Currently working as a quality inspector and safety representative for an aerospace manufacturing company in the Hartford area. Joe, thank you and welcome. Thank you. Let's jump right in. Sounds like you had a strong interest in writing and film for a while now. Tell us a little more about your background. What got you started on writing and publishing your first novel? I began taking a keener interest in writing in high school. And uh, I started putting mo- most of my efforts and thoughts into, into writing a book. And a friend of mine, Mike, and I, we used to, our, the time we would spend together would be at his house downstairs in his basement when we were both trying to write books. Mike was actually the inspiration for the character Mick in my novel. He had scoliosis as a kid and so was confined to having a cast or a full body cast on himself. So we spent the summers not going out doing sports and things like that, but just hanging out and writing and listening to music and things like that. And eventually he fell by the wayside with his writing. But mine, I, I continued and wrote my first book when I was like a high school teenager. And it was pretty awful. But I got probably <laughs> <laughs> inspired to writing, uh, writing another one. So I began to write, call it a South Side Story at the time. Yeah. Is the title of it. And the Lord's been long, one world, but here I am. Wow, that's great. That's great. Yeah, I know it. I have some of those similar books in my background. <laughs> it's somewhere in a box in the cellar. It's all I think. Might still have it somewhere. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Was there, so did this story, did this start back when you were in high school or? It was based on some activities that we did in the high school. Well, when I was probably a freshman or a sophomore, we went to a dinner theater and the, the play being shown was West Side Story. I fell in love with it. I thought it was great. I'd never seen anything like that before, having this story played out in front of you like that. It just inspired me. I caught fire. And at the same time, we were a bunch of young kids, restless and juvenile delinquents, and we would harass the police officer, officers in town. And we would fight our Roman candles over their police cars. <laughs> we were like this little makeshift gang that we had. So we started, hey, let's start a gang. It lasted about three days, and then the bigger kids came down and whooped some like my friends' butts, and that was the end of the gang. <laughs> But, but that was the background inspiring for, for the guns in the book and, and for this romance, uh, this star-crossed romance between the main characters, Jeff and Cindy, in the book, where I got the roots from it. Yeah. So would you say then, like, the, it's kind of the seed for this or the, or maybe the experience that kind of got this rolling? Would you say it was seeing that West Side Story? Or I think that had a lot to do with it. I really loved the play. But I was always like the part where the gang members were singing Officer Krupp Key and, and that stuff. I was like, well, what? I wish they had taken, I wish I had gone in a direction that featured them a little bit more. So I was like, well, maybe if I write something like that, I can do that. Uh, so yeah. that, that's kind of where I went with the gangs, but I still wanted to have love interest with Jeff and Cindy. Yeah. And, and the West Side Story is based on Romeo and Juliet. And so the characters die. And I said, well, what if they didn't die? It wasn't I should say that because I don't want to give away the ending of the book. But, but so I, that's, that's what inspired me to go in a different direction. So instead of west, they went south. So, <laughs> but we also call it a south side story because I'm from South Windsor and my, it was a code name between my friends and I about, I didn't want to broadcast it all over the school that I was working, I was starting to write this novel. We had this code name we called this out, how a south side story going. That would be our code name for talking amongst each other. I see. Did you have a sort of, oh, I'm going to start writing this. Was there a moment that you remember anyway, where you're just like, ah, oh, I'm going to, I got this story. I'm going to do it. Well, I mean, by the time I was graduating high school, I knew I wanted to be a writer. I was, my father was pushing me towards 
computer programming and that kind of crest and burned and like all that. And I was working, working warehouse jobs while I was writing at night kind of a thing. So it, it, it always been a, a progression that I knew it was something I wanted to do to be yeah. a writer. And then it just took a while to, to I thought I was going to get my first novel done by the time I'm 25. <laughs> but, but it's, it's been a while, but it's something I always was always been a part of me. So. Yeah. So how long is that? Would you say that the journey of this story has been most of us writers? It takes us many years to write yeah. a story. What's this story's fight or flight? How long do you think it has taken to get from when you started to where you? Well, I started, I wrote the first draft and it was probably nothing, not much like it is today. You know, I was probably in my twenties and then I, things come along, getting married and all this stuff and jobs and going, I went back to school. So a lot of it got put off on, I didn't stop writing, but it got shuffled to the back burner for a while. And then it started getting a real drive in my forties to really get it out there. Mm-hmm. And then I began, I finished all the plotting and the, the actual writing of it. And I began the editing part. It was like, wow, that's a chance. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm just going to edit. It's going to take me about, it'll take me about a month to edit. Yeah, sure. So it took <laughs> quite a bit longer than that. But I wanted to get it as good as it to be as a good a piece of writing as I, I could. And yeah. I've been hard on myself to make sure that I've ironed out a lot of kinks and things like that. Yeah, yeah. And have you worked on any other writing projects during this? Or is this pretty much this has been the one? Well, when I was going to Trinity College, I was writing a, a screenplay that, that really took over for a while. I had to put this aside to, to work on that. And that's something I want to return to after I'm all done with this to get back into that and go. I've only done a first run through on that. So I'm hoping to get back in that because there's a lot of things that I see that are wrong with it now that I want to correct. Yeah. And yeah. It's the, it'll be a good story too. Cool. But yeah. Cool. And I've also, I, I, I write for a newsletter for the union at my job and I'm the editor for that. And I hope I'll, with the writing and on that stuff. Yeah. And we've won some awards. We got, I mean, they have a, an international contest for all the newsletters from the union. And I've gotten, I haven't won the grand prize, but I've had some honorable mentions and I've had some second place, third place finishes and things like that. So it's nice. Let's get some recognition like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about the story's message. So fight or flight. In one of your, your bios, you wrote that you seek to reflect on the futility of violence, the loyalty of friendships, and the transformative power of love. I just spoke to me. I love that. <laughs> yeah. So I thought, let me, let's talk a little more about that. Yeah. So like, yeah. yeah. Well, obviously there's a lot of gang in the story. And one of the characters, Mick, goes down a violent path. And his results are pretty much a reflection on the path he takes. Jeff is torn between following the gangs and this new love interest of his with Cindy. And her being the police chief's daughter... They can't co the kid really coexist in his life very well. And so he's got to make some decisions. He's got to challenge some of his, his friendships. His friends obviously are seeing him being torn away from everything they've grown up with. And that's always a painful moment for the friend as well. And as far as the transforming power of love, he's just clearly going down a wrong path at the beginning of the story. And his, his affection for Cindy is able to turn him around and get him, get him to see the error of his ways and make him into a wholesome individual so yeah well, hopefully yeah some of the things that i was just thinking about that i really love is there are these moments where the uh, where they're talking of the members of the gang or talking about oh, we were we never really meant for it to be like anything horrible to happen we're just having some fun in a right blowing off steam and challenging authority and things like that. yeah uh, but we're seniors maybe we ought to just and also the fact that some of the members were like really dedicated to their sports or to their education. And it was really great to see. I just thought it was really interesting how you brought in some different kinds of qualities into that, the personalities of those gang members. It was really yeah, nice. It's, it's, there's so many of them that it's, it's, it was a challenge to find ways to develop each character into his own, meaning make him a little bit more three dimensional. Well, obviously, Jeff and Mick and Crazy Legs are the most three-dimensional characters in the story, but even getting Denny and, and TJ and Bumbles and, uh, we had a friend named Bumbles in high school too, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good to draw some little big names from high school as well. Yeah. Yeah. But, so it did, was there in the writing either early on, you just start in terms of talking about like the, that sort of that impact? But did you perceive a problem in the world and you wanted to address it with your writing? Yeah, I saw what 
when I set out, I wanted to try to tackle some stereotypes of got kids like Jeff who are not, they're not the leaders of, they're not the best students in the class and they're not, they've got problems at home. People still look up to Jeff as their leader. And I was trying to show that he's got this front that, yeah, hey, I'm Jeff Hollister. I'm the guy, the hero or the guy in charge. And, uh, and he's got a lot of flaws. He's got, um, problems at home. He's just, he grabbed any other kid in high school and maybe he's, people are looking up to him and placing him on this pedestal that it's a shaky, it's shaky ground. And so just so trying to show my, the message I'm getting is that even the people that we think are doing fantastic in life or are so strong and so brave, they've got flaws and they've got problems and they've got uh, a lot of things they have to work out on their own as well. That's like one of the messages I was trying to portray yeah. with the main character. Yeah, that's great. I think I think it's a powerful message because you're right. We just we have this tendency to maybe it's a maybe it's part of our media that creates stars out of people and then it's like then we think there's something like their lives are perfect some the interaction with the adults, Jeff, between the adults like the nurse and Chief Wallace and Mr. Stammer, they all look at him like he's a rotten kid, he's an enemy and he's somebody who's got Somebody's really got, they've really got a squash. And so he puts on this, this rebellious front to them, but to sort of show he's just another kid. And there's probably a lot of kids out there like that who are, who are putting on a facade, but really have, they're really struggling inside and trying to pull some answers on their own. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. And what impact would you like to, your book and audio book to have in the world? I'd like to have it, have some, generate some conversations about these kind of topics, about pressures that the kids are under growing up in, in those ages. Some of them come from broken homes, some of them exposed to threats, you know, yeah. gun violence and you know, other types of violence. And, and maybe like I said, start some conversations on how we can look at the kids that we struggle kids a little bit more open-mindedly. Yeah. Instead of trying to beat them down, trying to build them up instead. Yeah. yeah, I think that's great. Yeah. And even for teens that will listen to the audiobook and hear their own pieces of, oh, yeah, that's like me. It's, yeah. It's yeah, good. I'm hoping some people will, will identify with some of the different characters. You know, there are, yeah. you know, even something like Crazy Legs is kind of off the beaten path a bit, you know, but I think there's a lot of people out there who can, will be identified with him well. And he's definitely got a non violent streak in him. Uh, and as opposed to Mick, who was really a friend, but he's an antagonist friend. You know, so right. he's, he's like the, the enemy that you love, right? So, <laughs> yeah, right. with friends like that, you can get a lot of trouble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pause for a moment. We'll be right back. Frustrated by the royalty rates for your audiobook, annoyed that when the digital distributors say 70%, they actually mean 70% of 50% or 80% of 70%, neither of which is an actual 70%. Wishing there was a way to cut out or at least shrink the middleman. Yet, you want your audiobook listeners to have a smooth and positive experience, and a direct download sale from your website won't deliver that. Pro Audio Voices hears you. Out of our commitment to our author clients, we've created Amplify a program that provides an actual 65% royalties of the price you set, that gives you access to your customers' names and emails so you can reconnect with them, and keeps you in the driver's seat. Check it out at ProAudioVoices.com in the marketing menu. Let's shift gears here. Let's talk about the audiobook production process and what that's been like. So I know... When we first talked, you were clear already. You wanted a full cast production. And when I, it, it made sense to me, especially with the, the, your background, both in writing, but also in the cinema. When you were writing, did you already have it? In, was it like playing in your mind as a sort of as a full cast, if you will? Like, like a script? <laughs> well, yeah, for sure. When I started writing it, I was really interested. I was really into movies. I love action movies, Terminator and things like that. But, but I didn't know how to write screenplays. And there wasn't, any, there wasn't anybody in school teaching you how to write school screenplays. And I didn't really see a lot of that. Now you can find it anywhere. But at the time when I was getting into it, it was like, it was kind of a off the beaten path. And I just needed to write the story too. So I, I had a friend that 
a friend in school that had gone to Hollywood and appeared in a few movies and I wrote him a letter and said, you know how I get into screenplay writing? And I never heard back from him. So I, and I didn't really find that out about that until I was probably in my thirties and I took my first screenplay play class there and wrote some fun stuff. I really like writing comedy too. It's, it's one of the, one of the things I like to do is write funny stories and stuff. And I'm hoping to come up with some of that in the future, but uh, yeah, but yeah, let's get back to what your question was. It was kind of always in the back of my mind. And I was always thought I was did handle dialogue pretty well for writing. Um, I always kind of had a, I've told that we had a natural flair for a year for conversation, things like that. So I think that's yeah, helped me yeah. out a lot too. Yeah, definitely. No, it was really clear to me early on that you have a real good feel for dialogue. And I'd say it was a delight directing and performing in Fight or Flight. So we had a cast of 17 terrific actors. I thought it might be fun just to turn the interview around for a minute and ask, see if you have any questions about the parts of the production process that you weren't in the midst of. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's something, you know, I went through a lot of character demos and was able to pick out that. It was, that was heartbreaking because there's so many good ones and having to choose one is like, ah, I'm just yeah. terrible at telling somebody that you didn't get to get the <laughs> mark. So I, yeah. I'm glad that was your job in that mind. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I know that I also know that there were some people that uh, pro audio voices selected that we already had, that you already had in mind. I believe Michael Kirby was one of them. And was, I think there's a few more in there that you would, you would already say, well, this is the guy from this role. And yeah. This is the perfect guy for this role. And I just got to say that I, I thought your selections were spot on. Everybody was. This was just fantastic listening to them. And it's, it's such a delight listening. You have this book that you've been working on for so long and just hear it expressed out in the open with people reading it and acting it. And it was really a, really a pleasure or well experience. I, I really enjoyed it a lot. And to be honest with you, it made, I, cause I was still in the editing process while we were doing this, the final editing process of the novel and listening to it being read to me pointed out some things that I needed to to go back and correct. And some of them I did and some of them I still have to go back and I probably will do one more pass through of the actual book and make a few edits and have a second edition come out that really aligns well with the audio book because not that there's a lot that's different in them, but just a few phrases and things like that. Yeah. Like I said, hearing it read back to you really brings out the reader's ear for it. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting thing that is very common at, when we're producing audio books is that we, it, it reveals, like when somebody's reading it aloud, it reveals the places that are stumbling points or, um, yeah, and uncovers sometimes things like typos and stuff that every other proofreader and editor have missed. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah well, I, I've, and I've had it gone through uh, probably a half a dozen. I have one main editor. I really like her a lot, but she sub assigns it to her editing staff and different people along the way doing different things. And, and I've crossed things that they've listened to it all and like, how did you miss the world? But I miss it too. So it's like, so it's, it's editing is a challenging part of it, a really challenging part of it. So absolutely. Yeah. Is there anything about the production process itself that kind of stands out to you? Either something that maybe was surprising or just. I really enjoyed working with the music as well. And yeah. the, the music director, that was Jeff, Jeffrey, or no, Julian, Jeff, Julian, Julian. Oh, yeah. yeah. So it was really great working with him and trying to convey my, my musical affinity for, I wrote this novel and I like, like anybody else I'm doing it at home with my computer, with my music playing and things like that. And so it's, it's a whole creative process and then trying to communicate what's inspired me to write a certain way and then get that, get it over to Jillian. And that was fun and listening to, okay, how about this part here? And having the sound effects coming in and things like that. And the other part too was with the sound effects. I understand it could really be nice to have a little ding and crash for everything that goes on. And you can't do that, obviously. Yeah. Back to yeah. you. Well, but, uh, but like when we were going, we were reviewing that part of it, and you had to go through the novel to point out different sound effects. And I, I probably only came up with like 25 of them for the whole book. And then you guys were fine. And then wow, I'm listening to it. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. That would have been a sound and that would have been a noise effect. There is right in the writing itself. It's a, and so you guys caught a lot of that stuff too, and we were able to promote that. And made yeah. It good. Yeah. Yeah. So there was original music written by Julian Blackmore for this. And do you want to tell us just a little bit about that process in work? You talked about some, but maybe like when you got started and what were the kinds of questions that you were being asked? You were trying to figure out 
music styles and that sort of thing? I guess I would say really, I, I was asked a lot about the characters and how, who I think the character would like, like to name a famous actor or a famous role that would, that you believe the character would, would, uh, align with. So that would help pro audio voices determine the kind of yeah. person who would, be a, who would be a good narrator for that. Now that, that was challenging. That's kind of don't think of an elephant kind of thing where like, <laughs> like, yeah, and, and if there's something I had a, a year to, to ponder over, it would know to been able to pinpoint that real, <laughs> person, but, but you don't have that kind of time and this, and this yeah. process itself is, it's taken, it's taken a while. It's taken a little longer than I anticipated, but it's been, but you have to move along. I know you guys are great about keeping me on track and moving me along because it's easy to get bogged down on, on, on projects like this. And I'm really grateful that you were, you guys were able to, to share really was able to prod me when I needed to be prodded and things like that. So <laughs> yeah. it was good. Great. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of interpreting. What am I really trying to say here? What is, uh, what's the character really trying to express and that kind of thing? And then having, and having somebody voice or a person who can portray that. And that was challenging, but it was fun. Yeah. Well, it was, uh, the recording process for the, the audiobook production, especially all those group scenes, just to give our listeners a sense of like how that came together as we had actors in studios, wherever they were in the world. And yeah. each recording into their own thing. But we were in a Zoom meeting so that we could be reacting off each other, which makes a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, yeah that's a good point, too. So I was thinking about um, if you got the Jeff character, Michael Kirby over here, then the mid character, maybe lives across country or something like that. And having had those, when the back and forth exchanges between, between characters can be pretty cutting people off and, and things like that and to get it to all meld together it's pretty it's pretty amazing that you were able to do it so well and especially with in post covid time where you can't all get together i don't think yeah. we'd start it was still probably in some kind of covid restrictions when we started all this i believe it was certain yeah even so whether regardless of covid just being able to you know we have the reach of the world actors all over the world available to us when we record remotely like this and i'd say that all the actors just love it. Love to be a part of that uh, that group, those yeah. group sessions, and being able to play together, act together. It's a great opportunity. It's, it's fun. I, when I was at Trinity, when I was about to graduate, we had a. I was in a script writing class, and the professor, the professor, had us all come together for a show in, in the cafeteria with the stage, and had all these people come in. They had people from like. Theater groups come in and read the students' scripts and things like that. Like I got to participate in one script as a bit actor and having two professional actors beside me reading and I had to work my way in and hold the script along with them. That was a lot of fun. I really did. It was, it really yeah. is a cool experience. Well, I want to make sure that our, our listeners know how they can learn more about you and your writing. Would you like to tell them the website? Right, the website is w.josephdurette.com. And should be up and running anytime now. Okay. And also, I would like to highlight the fact that the this full cast audiobook with original music, sound effects, the works will be available in whatever your favorite audiobook retailer, library, music channel is. But the place to have the greatest impact, this will be not only best for Joe, but also best for listeners will be to get it through the Amplify Audiobooks app, which is just coming online. And if you're, if you go to the app store and you don't see it yet, then go to proaudiovoices.com slash Amplify Audiobooks and you'll be able to sign up to get updates for that. But we are right on the cusp of some history making moments so yeah look for it on amplify audiobooks okay and joe thank you so much for spending this time with me this has been really awesome it's been a real pleasure working with pro audio voice i remember what i was going to tell you now is how i got connected to pro audio voices in the first place is to go to uh, uh, become a member again at the connecticut office of the public association and i had stopped going for a little while but i'd gone earlier and while i was there i believe Somebody from your company must have come down and made a presentation and given us some business cards. And I had a business card. Maybe it was you. It was, was it me. You? Yeah. Wow, great. Wow, that's amazing. 
And I had this business card and it was like, cool. It was, but I was like, I was nowhere near being ready to do anything. I was, I was still in the writing phase. So I had this thing and, you know, I'm, a, I'm an author, so I'm a messy person. And I got a pack rat and I got, and I held on to this card for like a good 10 years. And I had to, and then wow. it was kind of, finally I get another, I had to check this thing out. And I went out and checked it out and I was like, full cast audio book. It's awesome. That is perfect. That's just perfect. <laughs> and then that's how we got connected. So it's just funny that I, I had this card from way back. And wow. I was like, on the floor in my office. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so great to let me know that. Thank you. <laughs> You see, it but just like, you never know. You just karma, never know. Yeah. It's beautiful. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, thanks, Joe, so much. We have been talking about Fight or Flight, A Southside Story by Joseph Durrett. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for Audiobook Connection, behind the scenes with the creative teams. Please take a moment to subscribe at audiobookconnection.com. The podcast is sponsored by Pro Audio Voices, helping great stories come alive through audiobook production and marketing. Learn more at ProAudioVoices.com. Again, thanks for being with us, and please join us next week.